All right. I probably won't stay here for long, but I'll start here with good intentions. So oh, my name's Chris Blackaby. I'm from Australia. I'm speaking English at the moment. It's very similar to your language. <laughs> we can translate afterwards. If I speak too quickly, just wave, or you want me to repeat something, just wave. I actually, I mean that, so uh, just, just wave, yep. I'm traveling with friends. We've got uh, Ashley from Texas. Welcome, Ashley. And uh, Bartosz from Poland. Uh, Bartosz is the head of security for me. Yeah, he, he has a, a knife <laughs> and tattoos, yeah, and uh, Ashley is in charge of quilting, she's the head of quilting for, for uh, Asia's Ministries, where we're launching into a whole new area, yeah. So, um, last, I spoke here last time, we had uh, two services, because we were split up. And I said, all right, I'm not going to prepare a message. I'm just going to um, see what God's doing. And so, uh, again, now we're doing that. So I'm just warning you, this message could be an absolute car crash or it could be the most wonderful message you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> I've, uh, I've got some scriptures as backup, you know, just in case. If I uh, call out a scripture, can we put it up there? Is, can we do that? All right. Okay, well, I may do that later. Uh, just to get you ready, maybe Ephesians 1, the chapter, maybe Ephesians 3, the chapter, maybe Psalm 16, the psalm. So <laughs> I'll come down here. This is much more comfortable for me. So is there an election on or something? <laughs> there is? Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, I'll actually be in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday. So that, that, that'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see who wins. I'll keep both hats. You know, I'll join that party. <laughs> that's not true. That's not, that's not true. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tread gently in this area. But um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just throw this out there. So um, when the Israelites were taking Canaan, they were taking a piece of land that Yahweh would have his own land on the earth, have his own people, to prepare a place for the Messiah. Yep. Yep. And that is the only thing happening in the world. It's the number one thing happening in the whole world. And so the army of Israel doing the work of God to prepare the way for the Messiah so we could be here now, okay, was walking through Canaan and they came across... Uh, an angel and Joshua says to the angel are you for us are you against us the very thing that God's doing on the earth the angel says neither I'm from heaven and that's you okay so right now a very very important decision has been made in America which will affect your country and the world for a long time yeah, but you're from heaven, okay? And that person from heaven should go and vote and make a decision for the righteousness of their country. But you're not under it. You're over it, yeah? And you're free from it, yeah? Otherwise, your emotions are tied to an outcome, but you're from a kingdom. The kingdom hasn't changed. Yep. So if you're sourced from that kingdom, no matter what happens on the earth, uh, you are sourcing your emotional state, your expectations of the future, your joy from an unshakable kingdom, from the place you're actually, fr actually from. So if you were the American ambassador to Haiti, yeah, and you're from America, you go, you shift to Haiti, you live in the embassy, the American embassy. That's your land, it runs by American law, it runs by American finance. It, does, it is actually a part of America. It's American soil for all effectiveness. Yeah. So if the Haitian um, economy goes down, 
What happens to you? Nothing. Haitian economy goes up. What happens to you? Nothing. You're actually detached from it. Your source is from another kingdom. Yep. So as the ambassador to Haiti, if you need to put on a dinner for a thousand people, America pays for it. You don't pay for it. If Haiti collapses and it's terrible and there's no infrastructure and you need two new Hummers to get around, America pays for it. You don't pay for it. America pays. You're doing the work of the kingdom and uh, your heart and your economy is attached to another kingdom even though you're in Haiti. Yep. So that's what's happening. That's how you live on this earth. You're attached to another kingdom. No matter what happens, you actually emotionally, financially, <laughs> spiritually uh, connected to another place. And we source from there. Yep. So that being said, uh, may the candidate that establishes righteousness in your land be elected. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, when you became a Christian, you didn't switch um, belief systems. You didn't switch religions. You didn't move from an atheist to being a Christian, or a New Ager, or a Buddhist to being a Christian. You didn't switch belief systems. You switched species. Okay? You're a completely different class of being now. Yeah? Before, you were a first Adam human. And now, you are a unique, unique beloved son of God. That's what you are. This thing that you are, this whole thing, body, soul, and spirit, this body, and your emotions, and your memories, and your spirit, now have a new nature. And that new nature is to be the beloved son of God. You are not a human being anymore. You're a son of God. And son isn't male or female. It's the name of the class of being that you are. Okay? So you can be a son of God and a princess. That's all right. Yeah? If you so desire. It's a free country. At the, at the moment. But this is a very important thing to understand, okay? Because seasonally, every now and then, a group of humans and the devil is their father and they want to express the nature of their father, which is to control everything. Every now and then, they have a go at governing everybody. It's been happening for thousands of years. Yeah, and round and round they go. Um, Nebuchadnezzar with, the, with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, everyone must bow to me and honor me. That desire to have complete control and complete worship comes up again and again and again, just in different forms and with different technologies. And so, right now, <laughs> this seed line, if I can call it that, who have a different father, is having a, a red hot shot, a red hot go. What do you say here? That's They're fixing to, is that what you're saying? <laughs> to control everything. It's their nature. It's their nature. And the, the wheat and the weeds, the wheat and the tares must grow up together. Yep. And they reveal themselves. Right. Yep. But we have a free choice. And if we fight on the same mentality that they're at, which is the knowledge of good and evil, they're evil, we're good. It's the wrong tree. And you'll eat of the fruit of that tree. Either now, or in four years, or in eight years, okay? Because we have a us versus them mentality, and we think we're good and they're evil, and we win then we'll be very ungracious winners. 
And that uh, has a cause and effect. And the effect is it stores up wrath in the losers. And one day when they win, that wrath will come out. Woo! Yeah, that's what would happen. Um, and as the sons of God, we're the free decision makers. We're the adults in the room. Okay? And so we can make a decision as uh, good Christians, which is a belief system, or we can make a decision as beloved sons of God, which is our true nature. Yeah? And our true nature is exactly the, exactly the same as the Father. When you receive Jesus Christ, you didn't change belief systems, you received the person of Jesus Christ. And he is your salvation. He's your sanctification, he's your righteousness, and he's your holiness. Okay? So when you received Jesus, when you believed in Jesus, you didn't get righteousness back. Adam lost it. Ah, oh, it's gone. Jesus went, oh, here, have it back. Okay? Because then you could lose it again. Day one, you could lose it. You probably did. Yeah? You didn't get righteousness back. You got Jesus. And he is your righteousness. And his work is finished. So you are righteous forever. Because Jesus is righteous forever. And your attitude didn't qualify you for righteousness. So your attitude now doesn't disqualify you. Are you a grumpy, angry Christian? That's okay. It doesn't change your righteousness. Because being grumpy or angry or grateful and full of joy, neither of those qualified you for that righteousness. It was a gift of a person. Yeah. So your attitude didn't qualify you, so your attitude doesn't disqualify you. Your actions didn't qualify you. What did you do to become righteous? What action did you take? What did you change? Did you stop smoking? Did you start reading the Bible twice a day? What did you do? Nothing. You received the person of Jesus Christ. And he is your righteousness. And his actions are done. You have the same right standing before God that Jesus does. The exact same. So... Before you got out of bed this morning, God looks at you, you've healed the sick, you've raised the dead, you fought the Pharisees, you lived a sinless life, you forgave those who were persecuting you, as they were killing you, you forgave them, you cried out for their mercy. This is what you did. Because that righteousness is given to you. Everything he did is now ascribed to you. In fact, is this amazing? Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation. Before any crime was committed, all the crimes that we see and that we know, Jesus laid down his life for all those before they happened. That's how loving he is. That's how righteous he is. That's my, that is how much he is like his father. And you are not the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, but... The righteousness, of, the righteousness of doing that is given to you. And God looks at you and he sees the type of person that will lay down their life before the foundation of the world for all the sin and all the crime which is about to happen, that you would do that. And you would even do it for Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. That's how loving you are. For the whole world. The whole world includes Democrats. <laughs> Sailor. This is your true nature. This is your true nature. So you need to establish righteousness, but people aren't your enemy. The powers and principalities are your enemy. Humans are prisoners of war. If you were with the US Army and one squadron got taken prisoners of war, would you then call them idiots and hurl insults at them? Would you go get them? 
You go get them. That's the heart of the Father. He'll leave a hundred to go get one. This is you. This is your nature. When you receive Jesus, this nature to lay your life down on behalf of your enemies, on behalf of those who persecute you, was given to you. And that's who you are. So we need to emotionally extract ourselves from winning and losing us versus them. Because you're from heaven. And heaven is laying down its life for the whole earth. That people, that group of people, will change their city, will change their county, will change their state. That group of people. And we have a test coming up. A test how we respond if we do not get the outcome we desire, or probably harder, if we do get the outcome we desire. In that time, if you do get the outcome you desire, will you lay your life down on behalf of your enemies, the people who are persecuting you, the people who are attacking you? You can, because that's your true nature. That's what the Father would do. We know that's what the Father would do, because he does, because Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. In fact, all the people who are fathers in the kingdom pleaded on behalf of the guilty. In fact, God calls himself the God who justifies the ungodly. That's your father, and you have his nature. You have his eyes. You have his heart. That's your desire, to be good to all. If you do these things, you will be like your father in heaven, Who sends rain on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust, the Republicans and the Democrats? You're good to all. So the whole burden of knowing who's right and who's wrong, just throw it off. The whole burden of working out who did what, who sent what email where, who did what, take it off. Okay? Let it go. Your emotional source Your nature comes from heaven. You look exactly like your father. The Sermon on the Mount is not a list of things to attain to. The Sermon on the Mount describes you. You've changed systems. What was a law to govern you externally is now your internal nature. It used to be under first Adam, which we all were, thou shalt not have any God but me. But under second Adam, thou shalt not have any God but him. That's your nature. Thou shalt not steal. In the kingdom, thou shalt not steal. You won't. It's not your nature. Your nature is the very righteousness of the risen, glorified Christ. As he is, so are you now in the earth. And John wrote that. He wrote that in 1 John. As he is, so are you now on the earth. Yeah. And John saw Jesus as he is. Fire in his eyes. Sword in his mouth. Voice up rushing waters. Brass feet. As he is, so are you now. It's given as a gift. God doesn't want you to be a Christian. God never called you a Christian. In fact, I am a Christian. Okay, let's just establish a baseline here. You're a Christian? Yes, I am. That's what I tell the world. Because the term Christian wasn't given to us by God. It was given to us by pagans. Mm -hmm. They were worshipping pagans called us Christians. And they're right. We Follow this guy we call Christ. That's the external observation. They're Christians. They're Buddhists. They're Muslims. Okay? But God didn't make us Christians. Jesus wasn't a Christian. Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was a uniquely begotten Son of God. And that's what you are. Because you become what He is. Because He gave you Himself. And He is your nature. 
So if people ask you a Christian, yeah, 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 why not? But between you and God, you're not a Christian. You are the uniquely begotten Son of God. You are identical to the risen Christ, the risen, glorified Christ. That's what you're given. Romans 6 says, Don't you know when you're born, when you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death? Okay? Which means the miracle of being saved when you accept Jesus, instantly, mystically, you're on the cross 2,000 years ago and you died with him. But you didn't feel any sting of that death. He took it all and you're there with him. And it says, and you're buried with him, co-buried, and the same power that rose Christ from the dead rises you from the dead, a new being, and that says, so that we can participate in the same resurrection life he has. So when you went to church previously, the Bible will be opened, the Gospels will be read, and the pastor will give a three-point sermon. It will say, are you like Peter that, you know, that betrayed Jesus or spoke too much? Are you like Thomas that doubted? You, you should be like that woman that pushed through the crowd. Be like that woman pushing through the crowd. Or are you like Mary? Are you like Martha? Why are you comparing yourself to unregenerate humans? They're not Christians. They're not sons of God. There's only one person in the gospel that's born from heaven. That's Christ. So the only person in scripture you can compare yourself to is Christ. That's it. He is the model of who you are. Jesus was showing what someone born from heaven does to a fallen world. He brings the kingdom for free to the just and the unjust. He never asks why. He just fixes it. Is that the kingdom? That's not the kingdom. Here's the kingdom. Sometimes people approached him and he responded and sometimes he made a free will gesture out of his own heart. He's allowed to. It's his kingdom. It's your kingdom. We hear lots of stories like, this is how this person got this miracle out of Jesus. They did this, and they said that, and they performed this, okay? And then they had the faith for it, and the faith drew it from him. Yeah, that's a way in that moment. But who had faith for Lazarus? Just Jesus just chose. Free will choice. The... Um, the widow's uh, son, Jesus sees a funeral, has compassion, no one's believing for it, free will choice. And that's how God is to you, a free will choice. Your behavior, miracles and healings are not a reward for good behavior. Your good behavior will not get you one more miracle and won't get you one more healing. Completely detached. In fact, Paul says, if anyone tells you that, may they be eternally condemned. That's to be bewitched. Everything comes as a free will gift of the nature of a father who is good to everyone. And that's your character as well. But we only give what we have. And so, we need to make a decision to receive from God despite our attitude or our behavior. And receiving from him, despite our attitude, or our behavior, or our life, or how we qualify ourselves, or disqualify ourselves, we move all those things to the side, and we receive from God out of his nature alone, will change you. Because it's kindness that leads to repentance, which is changing your mind. And when you see God be good to you, separate from your behavior, separate from your attitude, just have his nature alone, then you become like that to other people. You've been fathered. And when, you, when someone fathers you, they reproduce themselves in you. So God's fathered you, and you receive freely from God, separate to anything you've done. The thing you're praying for, the thing you desire, is not going to be given to you because of your behavior or your attitude. 
Because if it's given to you according to your behavior and your attitude, then someone comes along and says, how did you get that miracle? Well, then you'll tell them because of this behavior and this attitude. And in that moment, you just invented a new religion. So, throw it out. You are a son of God, a new class of being. First Adam was a living being. Second Adam is a life-giving spirit. You are now no longer a human being. You are now a life-giving spirit. You've never been a life-giving spirit before. And there's nothing you can do to qualify yourself. As hard as it was for you to be a human. Okay? How much did you... Be more human. You were just born. By the will of another. And now you're born again. And you are now a life-giving spirit. And all we're doing is being transformed by the renewing of our minds. To line up with what you already are. A perfect, beloved son of God. So Jesus, at the start of his ministry, God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus hadn't done anything. Not a miracle, not a test, not a trial, not a dead raising, nothing. Because that's his nature. That's where he starts. In complete inaction, inactivity, nothing, baseline, his being, the being that he is, is the beloved son of God. And that's what you are. When you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed, when you swear at that idiot driver, (laughs) no matter who you vote for, you are the beloved son of God. That is the being that you are in the righteousness of Christ. So when you go see God, when you go pray, that's who goes into heaven. So I go see God, he's up here. (laughs) I just walk in, completely righteous, completely holy, the beloved son. Hey, dad, I look exactly like you. And all you can do is believe. And that's all he wants. No flesh will inherit this kingdom. No flesh will get you up here in God's presence. No behavior, no attitude, no consistency, just believing you received a free gift. That's what puts you here. In fact, you live here. You're raised and seated. Raised up and seated because there's nothing left to do. Raised and seated. You're at rest. Anything you do to qualify yourself here or maintain yourself here in your own conscience will separate you from God. Because you just invented a religion. It's not, it's not Christianity, if I can call it that. It's something else. Well, it probably is Christianity. <laughs> it's something else. <laughs> you just invented something. And then everything you think you need to do right and not do wrong is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the very thing that got you kicked out, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, knowing what's, right, knowing what's wrong, rather than just receiving from the nature of a father to qualify yourself, you're going to use that thing to get you back in. The very thing that was kicked out, we're trying to use to get us back in. The very thing Jesus was nailed to, that thing, which he hates, we're going to use that to get back in. You're going to leave the whole system... It's abhorrent. To use that system is to have the devil as your father. All religion, all religion is to have the devil as your father. Either you've got a loving father who made a way, or you've got another father. So it needs to be that abhorrent to you. You just received the free gift that Jesus stooped down, made you great, put you in him, and raised and seed you in heavenly places with him forever. We're not praying, 
Father, please come down. Come be with us, Father. I really should have thought this through. <laughs> we're, we're saying, Father, let's go down. Yeah. Yep. Christianity <laughs> is outside heaven, outside the curtain. Send your spirit. Send revival. Fall upon us. Renew your deeds. Great, great Old Testament prayers. Come down. Come down on us. Bless us with your presence. If we're desperate enough, if you see how holy we are, if you see how committed we are, come down. This is Christianity. Bring it down. But sonship is where Jesus is. You're in him. And we look down. Sons command down. Christians beg up. You command. Do you ever see Jesus beg? Do you ever see Jesus say, send your presence, let it rain? Well, here's your model. Because you're him. In fact, there's only one time that Jesus asked God to do something for him. And that was the raising of Lazarus. And he says, I don't normally do this. <laughs> He's making a point. This is not the way. I don't normally do this. But for the sake of everyone watching, Father, would you <laughs> help me raise this person? Outside that, he just commanded. And then his disciples just commanded. His disciples didn't ask him to do anything. In fact, when they did ask him to do stuff, he told them off. You do it. Why are you asking me? I've given you me. As Tommy said, God's words, God's words in God's mouth are as powerful as God's words in your mouth. You being there is as good as Christ being there. Otherwise, he lied. He said, it's better that I leave. That's clearly not true. If you were here, Jesus, well, you are. In fact, anyone that says Jesus isn't here, that saying, that thought, is of the Antichrist. That's what it is. Because anyone can say that Jesus has now come in the flesh is not of the Antichrist. Jesus has come in the flesh. Here you are. Okay? Jesus left so there could be one billion of him to change the earth, to change creation. Nothing can qualify you for this. No fasting, no good behavior, no Bible study, nothing. It can only be received as a gift. You're righteous forever. Can we put up Ephesians 1, please? He has made you righteous and holy and blameless forever. This was his plan. And he did it. So you are. If you've received the free gift of Christ once, that word, that seed's gone in you, and that's now your nature forever, and you're holy and blameless in his sight forever. And that's who talks to him. I don't care what you looked at on the internet. I don't care how much you owe on your credit card. I don't care if this is your sixth marriage. Because Christ isn't on his sixth marriage. So neither are you. Christ isn't addicted to the internet. Neither are you. Christ doesn't have a spending problem with his credit card. So neither do you. If you think, I need to pay off my 10 grand on my credit card before I go see Jesus, you just invented a religion. All right. Hmm. All right, that's not, that's not going to work. Let me, uh, let me read it here. All right. Ephesians 1. Yep. Reloading. Great. 
on my one bar of... Uh, here it is. All right. I'm going to start from verse 3 here. So we don't tell the Bible what Christianity is. It tells us. Yeah? Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. All right, let's just stop there. All right, this could be a long sermon. No, no. Blessed, blessed be the Lord, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So he's already given you every spiritual blessing. So you never have to ask for one. You never have to ask. If you ask for what you already got, you've just invented a religion. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. If you think you're out here for any reason, then you will ask for spiritual blessings by a religion of your own invention. But because you are in heavenly places already, you already have them. Everything you need for life and godliness has been given to you. So you don't have to ask for it. You already have it. (laughs) If we stop asking God to do what he's already done, and we stop asking God to do what he's asked us to do, your prayer life is pretty much over. You think of all your prayers. All right. I'm going to stop asking him to give me stuff he's already given me. I'm going to stop asking him to do what he's called me to do. Thank you, God, for mum. And rainbows. And Pastor Tommy. We good? Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us. So before the foundation of the world, God knew who you would be. Hey, work that out, it's up to you. God knew who you'd be. Either he knew you or knew you'd be created or something. And he chose you to be holy and and blameless in his sight forever. That was his plan. So this is scripture where we get Christianity from. And this scripture is saying that you are holy and blameless in his sight forever. And this is what he wanted before the foundation. This isn't some like theological grid and we are a grace gospel people so we read the Bible like this. This is clearly stated that before the foundation of the world He chose you to be holy and blameless in his sight forever, in his son Jesus Christ, the beloved. So you're holy and blameless in the beloved forever. And your whole battle, we're going to call that for life, is to believe that. Because if you're holy and blameless, you will go see the Father. If you're not holy and blameless, you will do something to make yourself holy and blameless. And that is religion, and that is the expression of having the devil as your father, so don't do it. It's that abhorrent. It's a rejection of everything Christ did. Not losing your salvation, just not living in the benefits of your salvation, which are a free gift. If you receive it as a free gift, it's inheritance. If you work for it, it's wages. Wages are attached to your capacity. Inheritance or gift is attached to the nature of another. You need to surrender to the nature of another. Yahweh is a father who desired to have children to be exactly like him forever. And he made a way for him to do it as a gift so it could never be taken from them. That's what you've received. You've received a kingdom. you received the king, Jesus Christ, and his kingdom as a free gift only by believing. By believing you're here, you live in the benefits of being here. All of you are here, metaphorically speaking. All of you are raised and seated in heavenly places. 
right now, forever. You are holy and blameless forever. This was his idea. And it's done. He achieved his idea. He's made you holy and blameless. So you never have to qualify or disqualify yourself again. When you ask God for something, you never have to self-audit. You never have to look at your life and look at your behavior and say, do I line up? That's the first thing that happens. Your car breaks down. You need $6,000 by Monday. You go to God and say, God, I need $6,000. And what you do next depends if in your mind, because you are here, in your belief, in your heart, you're standing here or if you're standing down here. I need $6,000 by Monday. Okay, well, I've got all these steps. Have I been tithing? And or you owe two grand on my credit card because of something, you know? And then, and also, have I been reading my Bible? Well, have I been reading my Bible? And or you owe 10 grand on my credit card? A religion of your own invention. But we all do it. We all do it. I do it. It's the human nature. It's the old man wanting to impose a religion that says you do not have a good father. This process here is the fall. Did God really say? What we're doing is questioning the nature of God, which is his word. That's one thing. His word is his nature. So another father came along and put his word in us. His word is his seed. He's fathering himself in you. He's saying, is God really a good father? Is he really a good father? Will he give you his word by his nature? Is he going to give to you because you're a son? Is he really going to do that? And Adam and Eve heard that. They went, no, he's not a good father. I'm going to take from the knowledge of good and evil. A knowledge of good and evil is the nature and culture of the current church. Don't do this, do do this. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. And that is the nature of Satan. Because he's an orphan that says, you don't have a good God. So, only $6,000 for a car, and it's probably broken because I didn't look after it or something. Yeah? And now, I audit myself. What have I done? Am I here? Am I here? Maybe if I'm here... I get Pastor Tommy to pray for me because he's a pastor. And then I can just reach out and maybe I'll get what I need. Yep. The whole thing is be under witchcraft. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Why do you receive the Holy Spirit to have miracles performed amongst you? Because you believed? Ta-da. Or because you behaved? It's because you believed. So now being put here in Christ forever, holy and blameless in his sight forever by believing, why have you returned to behaving? If you can have miracles, if you can have the Holy Spirit, if you can have righteousness by behaving, then Christ died for nothing. He says if anyone teaches this, may it be eternally condemned even if an angel from heaven comes and teaches this, may be eternally condemned by belief from the start to the end, making the call on the nature of another. Did God really do this for you? Forever? That's the question. What happened? What is the gift of Jesus Christ? Is the gift of Jesus Christ, okay, my sins are forgiven in the future, I live down here, and I just hold until my body dies? That's church culture. The death of your body gives you access to heaven. But the death of your body doesn't give you access to heaven. The death of Christ's body gives you access to heaven. His resurrection means you can live it now. Yeah. So, you're down here (laughs) waiting for something Or, even better, rather than waiting to die, 
you can do ministry. You ready for this? Because ministry gets you here. Deacon, elder, apostle, whoa. You know? And you can do, you know, Sunday school or outreach or, you know, okay? So you're not these crazy, awful Christians that just received Jesus and waiting to die. You're getting on with the kingdom, and you're establishing the kingdom and ministry. I'm doing this, and I'm getting better. I'm going to Bible college. If you think that establishes anything for you before the kingdom, you are under witchcraft. You are deceived, because no flesh will inherit this kingdom. The high priest, who used to enter the Holy of Holies in God's presence, was not allowed to sweat. No human effort is allowed. It can only be received on the nature of another. Did God really say? Did God really say he raised and seated you in heavenly places? Did God really say he's made you holy and blameless forever? Will you receive a word, a promise? Will you believe God's nature as an act of your free will? over everything else that you know and every other voice, every other father. You've only got one father. And so you only want his word, his seed, his siring, his nature in you. So you only listen to the voice of one. And if God said, I made you holy and blameless forever, then despite all the evidence in your life, all emotions, all that that fold of this thick of accusations against God you've got in your locker. <laughs> Throw them all out and believe a word. That I raise and see you in heavenly places, holy and blameless forever, as a free gift. The nature and the person of Christ has been given to you. Even as he chose us, so he chose us, we didn't choose him, no effort. Nothing. You can't bring anything to this party. You have nothing to bring. It can only be received. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. He chose it. You bring nothing to this party. Not on day one, not on day ten, not even the sacrifice of your praise. Nothing. He chose you according to his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the beloved. He blessed us in him with redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan to the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So here it is. Here's the mystery being revealed. Heaven's not up there and we're down here. God's plan is to make heaven and earth one thing. I'm not for or against rapture, but this is your hope. You're out of here. You're missing the actual purpose of your existence, which is to bring heaven and earth together under Christ as one. This was his goal. To change creation, to change this, and to change this. There's only one way to do it. It was to be like your father, who sends rain on the good and the evil. You are a spirit being. You are a life-giving spirit already. And your true nature is to plead on behalf of the guilty. That's what you do. Abraham pleaded on behalf of Solomon and Gomorrah. Moses was offered the whole of Israel. God said, these sons of Abraham are too naughty. Uh, made me very angry. They're very evil. I'm going to wipe them out. 
Abraham's line is gone. It's now going to be Moses. Moses is going to be the Lord, uh, the, the father of, of faith. And we're going to be descendants of Moses. And Jesus is going to come to the line of Moses. And God says, I'm removing these people. I'm starting again with you, Moses. And Moses said, I'd rather you remove me and forgave them. And that's a miracle. You can't say that by your own strength. But he pleaded on behalf of the guilty. Yeah. We see Jesus plead on behalf of the guilty. (laughs) That's very clear. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. One that amazes me, like you can forgive your enemies, yeah? Like you don't know them. They're doing stuff. You say, forgive them, Lord. But on the night he was betrayed, he gave up his body. Betrayed. Different to enemies. Enemies, you know what's going on. Betrayed is by your friends and your companions. On the night he was betrayed, he gave up his body. That's your nature. And knowing that's your nature, that you'll pray on behalf of your enemies. And if you are betrayed, you'll give up your body for them. You are in complete freedom. Your decision's already made. What do you have to fear? If you will bless your enemies, if on the night you're betrayed by your closest friend, you're so like your Father in heaven, who before the foundation of the world gave himself up, before the crime even happened, that's who you are, then you're set. You don't fear death. You don't fear the future. You don't fear lack. You're raised and seated in heavenly places exactly like your father. You've been given the nature of God. 1 Peter says you can partake in the divine nature. What does that even mean? What's the father like? Well, fortunately, we had his son come and he's the exact representation of the father. You plead on behalf of the guilty. You lay your life down for your enemy. On the night you're betrayed, you give up your body. And you decide to do that already. And deciding to be this person, love, lay down their life for another, to live in this pre-forgiveness, to bless your enemies, not just forgive them, bless them, call blessing upon them. That's what the Father would do. That's what you would do. That, I believe, is transfiguration. That is to change this nature that was put in you of another father that says revenge, that says uh, work by works. To qualify yourself. You're separate. To receive this nature. It doesn't mean be a doormat. Because a doormat's not a choice. A doormat's just somebody who doesn't like themselves. Jesus had the power to crush them. Yeah? So he, he transfigured in front of Pilate. If he transfigured then, he would have won his argument, I feel. Yeah? He could cool down, what was it, 7,000 or 70,000 angels? He died. They mocked him as he died. And, you know, said, heal yourself. Then he came back. He did heal himself. Well, God did. That would have been a good time to go smash some heads, yeah? But he didn't. Even when he had the power to crush them, he, he laid down his life to give them the opportunity to choose him as a good God out of their own free will. And that's exactly what you are. You don't have to. You're a son of God. And you can crush. Because who you forgive is forgiven. Who you don't forgive is not forgiven. That's the power you have. You have his nature. Knowing you have this power. Knowing you can walk away. John and James, they leave the city and the city reject Jesus and they say, shall we call down fire on this city? 
The point being is, they knew they could. And Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you're of. He says, who's your father? That's not... Who's your father? There's only two spirits going on. Yeah. Let's go read this. We'll close with this with Stephen. So I'm going to read the very last section of Acts 6. And I'm going to read some of Acts 7. And then we're going to boldly step into heaven. Okay. So Acts 6, Stephen is seized. Now Stephen is uh, just a Christian dude. Not an apostle. Just a son. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. So just a Christian doing great signs and wonders. And some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and the Cyrians and, of, and the Alexandrians, and of those from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So here we have the two seed lines. One, being good to all, and other, inspiring murder. This is Cain and Abel. It's the same pattern. That's what you'll see all the time. Cain and Abel. Always going on. And they set up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, so if you bear false witness, who's your father? The devil, who was alive from the beginning. Yep. And the murderer. That's what they're planning, to lie and murder. So they're just expressing the nature of their father. <laughs> this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So, Stephen's transfiguring. Right? His face is becoming... When the Bible says angel, it doesn't mean like a cherub, like... Hmm. Hmm. Okay? It means a being from heaven. A messenger from heaven. He's transfiguring. And then, Stephen... Uh, reads out the charges against Israel and uh, he's, pretty, he's pretty strong on it. And at the very end of chapter 7 he says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Okay? So what is he doing? He's pretty much instigating the death penalty here. He's instigating the death penalty. And there's a reason for this. He knows, as soon as he says, I've seen the face of God, they're going to kill him. Okay? He's made a decision. Which is why he, he transfigured. Because in his heart, he already made a decision. Behold, I said, uh, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, so executed him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at their feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. Why did Stephen transfigure? Because in his heart, he had made a decision. I'm going to bless these people. I'm going to forgive them. I cry out for their forgiveness, even as they're my murderers. That's the nature of the father. He transfigured because he overcome this record of another father and became his father in heaven. 
who lays, he, he blesses the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. The God who justifies the ungodly. So a seed falls to the ground and springs up. Okay? So what do you do? Then they, then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Who Saul? Paul. Stephen exchanged his life and his anointing and gave it to Paul. Everything Stephen was going to achieve in his life, he laid in his life for his enemy. And his enemy became Saul. I'm not trying to create a theology here, but he purchased Paul's future with his own death. I don't purchase the right word to use, so just you know what I'm saying here, though. Yeah, that's you. That's that's the final death. If you, your true nature already given to you, is that you send rain on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. And I know that terrible things have happened. I know they're genuine crimes. But that's why. It, forgiveness is a miracle I used to be very angry at my dad and God worked on me for a while about that I'm like but if I forgive him then no one's ever going to hold those charges against him because only I know that he did those things Yeah. so if I let him go he got away with it and it's like ding ah forgiveness that's what it is so I removed all my charges against him that's what forgiveness is I thought and now I've got no charges against my dad. Done. No one will ever know my disappointments, my whatever. They're gone. And then uh, maybe a year later, um, God came to me and said, you need to forgive your dad. I'm like, but I, I've, I don't tell anyone. I keep silent. I don't complain. It's gone. I'm handing him to you. If you bless him, you bless him. You curse him, you curse him. I pray for his mercy. He's all yours. And God said, do you plan the goodness of your father? Do you think and imagine a better life for him? Do you uh, think of things in advance that he would like? Do you call out his greatness? I was like, no. I just didn't care. I just got rid of it. Gone. Get on my life. Do you want to forgive? and become like your Father in heaven who sends rain on the good and evil, the just and the unjust. I started to do that. And I realized in doing that, my heart opened the fact that God does that for me. At that time, I never even imagined God planned anything for me. He thought, in three years, Chris will be here doing this. I'm so excited. Never crossed my mind. But just in tapping it, you start. That's from the nature within. It wasn't the work to get here. I was expressing my true nature. I started being good to my father and planning good things for him and blessing him. And in that, I became like, God, I overcome this record. And my, my dad's actually a pretty good guy. I know that you've experienced some awful, horrendous crimes. And forgiveness isn't saying it's okay. Forgiveness is actually saying, no, that's a terrible crime. And I'm forgiving it. I'm taking this charge that I hold against them, rightly so, by the knowledge of good and evil, rightly so, I'm bringing it into heaven's justice system. I'm handing them to you, God. And if you bless them, you bless them. And if you bring them repentance by kindness, that's what you do. I'm handing them to you. And now, I cry out on behalf of of the guilty. I say, Lord, I've been forgiven the big debt. Forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they do. I'm not as betrayed. I lay down my body. I'm like you. And that's a miracle. That miracle has already been given to you. That's your true nature. So what we're going to do, uh, you can stay seated. You can stand up. It's up to you. But we're going to walk through that veil that's in the, remember the temple had the veil and they walked through the Holy of Holies. 
and you're already in the Holy of Holies, we're just lining up our, our imagination, our soul and our body with what's already true. So just imagine before you is a veil and you are the righteousness of Christ, holy and blameless in his sight forever. And your desire is to bring heaven and earth together. And your only way to do it is to express the nature of your Father. And we step through that veil. Bold we come in. All the old clothes get taken off us. And new clothes get put on us. We belong here. And we say, Dad, you are our Father. Your word, your seed, your nature is expressed in us. You were the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so are we. And we choose to be like you, our Father, a God that could wipe out nations, but instead chooses to lay down his life so that people will f- may g- get given the opportunity to freely choose us as good. Father, we want to send rain on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust, and become true sons of the Father in heaven. We look at Jesus, we look at Stephen, we say, yes, Lord. And Father, wherever we're at on this journey, we just take that, that crime that's come to our mind, and where we're not willing, but willing to be made willing, just wherever we're at, we say, Lord, this is a genuine crime. It truly did happen, and it truly had its effect. We lifted up this crime and the person. We hand it to you. We say, Lord, we hold no more charges against them. We leave that burden off us. We put them in your hands. You can directly operate with them. And Lord, either as a desire, or as an act of raw will, or as a first experiment, <laughs> we say, Lord, you've forgiven us a giant debt. You've made me holy and blameless in your sight forever. My sins will never be held against me. And for this event and this person and people, we say, Father, we know you're loving. We know you're kind. We know you send rain on the good and evil. And we say, Lord, for these people, may their sins be forgiven, may they be blotted out, may kindness lead them to repentance and the ultimate justice and even the ultimate revenge is their complete salvation and walking in sonship that Jesus has paid for this and that's what we ask that you're good to all and what a joy it is to say the same words our father would say, say the same words Jesus would say. Forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. And just enjoy, just for a few moments here, being holy and blameless forever in the beloved. You've just expressed the divine nature. The nature of that was the blood foundation for all of creation. You've just lined yourself up with absolute holiness, truth, and love. You've expressed the nature of your Father. Father, with this burden gone from us, gone from our nervous system, gone from our DNA, gone from our field, our souls, we ask that you would just touch these areas now and flood it with life. Resurrection life, the same resurrection life you have. We are life giving spirits, and we will see heaven and earth come together. By expressing who we already are the beloved Son, the risen, glorified, uniquely begotten, beloved Son of God. And this seed, this word which has gone out today, Lord, may receive a hundredfold return as we rest in it. And it grows and it grows and it grows. I'm the clear of this congregation 
that if you've seen Legacy Church, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Thank you, Father. We'll come back again and again. We just take this new reality into our very being, into our soul and our body. We step back into Ohio and release it here. And the blessing's gone out. Angels go and enforce this. We look forward to the salvation of many. What was, what was meant for our destruction is now going to be for the salvation of many. We look forward to the salvation of many. And we just rest now, knowing that it has been done. Holy and blameless in your sight forever. Based on your character alone. And as true sons do, we just believe a word. Amen. Amen. That's good, yeah? So we know that... Uh, how do you feel? Do, do you physically feel different? Just note the state of your body and the state of your emotions now as you've lined yourself up with your true nature, which just grows and grows and grows. And now live in the freedom of not having to hold things to account. And the fact that you can call out for mercy for a whole earth. Yeah. You don't care. You're from heaven. What about this? What about this? I'm from heaven. I'm being good to all. Yeah. Thank you. You've really honored the word. This word's going to grow and grow in the soil. That's what it does. A farmer goes to bed. He wakes up, the crop's grown, he doesn't know how. This is how the kingdom works. There's nothing you can do to be more forgiving. The nature must grow within you. And it's a free gift of a, of a, of a father. Yeah. Yeah.